Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. The battle in Congress over the border wall is still ongoing, as you know, now into its third week. Large swaths of government remain shut down. Trash remains on the ground. The president says, though, he will not give in until he gets funding for a border wall. The president plans to address the country tomorrow night. Then he's going to travel to the Mexican border later this week to make his case. On the Democratic side, meanwhile, the battle lines remain exactly in place as they were last week. They can't allow a wall to be built under any circumstances. They've said so many times, mainly because of the risk it might actually secure the border. They can't say that out loud, needless to say. So they have other storylines. You know how those go. They argue that because walls have worked well for thousands of years, somehow they won't work now. If we're talking about border security, the overwhelming number of undocumented people in the United States overstayed visas. Mm -hmm. They did not cross the border. The solution to that is not a concrete wall. This wall is no deterrent. By proposing a fifth century solution in terms of this medieval border wall for a 21st century problem. We don't think the wall is a good technology to do the objective. Possible that's a coordinated talking point, just guessing. In case it doesn't work, here's another talking point. Walls are just immoral, whether they work or not. The inference that you draw from a wall is that's the only way to do that. That right. actually is an immorality. It builds walls mm -hmm. in people's minds about who should come here and the sure. rest. It's a very sad thing. I hate the wall. I think it's immoral. I think it's wasteful. Are we a country that puts a wall between ourselves and an allied nation? A wall is an immoral uh, symbol for our country. Okay. Just in case you're keeping track on your morality chart at home, walls are moral, more than moral, in fact, laudable when they're board, built in Jordan or Israel or Tunisia with American backing. When they're built here to protect our own population, they are immoral. Okay, that's argument number two. Here's argument number three, popular with cable news creations like Rick Wilson. Anybody who supports the wall is inbred. The idea of a physical wall, it, Donald Trump loves selling this to his base. And again, these are people who are not sophisticated. They are not bright. They do not understand the complexities. Okay, the here we go again now with, yeah, so, here we go with, right. with condescending to us uh, in the Trump Steve, base. We're just I, I, about Steve, to dump the shoe one fish, wall. Gotta wear it, pal. Uh, yeah, it's complexity. It's kind of people who aren't Rick Wilson just wouldn't understand. They're not intellectuals like Rick Wilson. That's what he's telling you on CNN. Those are the arguments. What are the actual arguments for and against a wall? Well, we found someone who has had the difficult job of overseeing protection on the border. His name is Mark Morgan. He led the Border Patrol under President Obama. He does not stay for President Trump. He joins us tonight for his view on that. Um, Mr. Morgan, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Tucker, for having me. So you. the idea that walls don't work, that seems like the most real of the arguments we just heard. Do they work? Yes, they absolutely work. And if you look in the past, you don't have to go too far back in history that a bipartisan legislation that was passed, the, the, the Secure Fence Act. Yes. In 2006 and 2012, bipartisan legislation passed where they built the wall or fence or physical barrier, whatever you want to call right. it. It's a wall. It works. So I just want to be completely clear. I have no idea what your politics are. You worked for Obama. You did not work for Trump. So I don't know what that says, but just to be totally clear, we're having you on to talk about this in your capacity as someone who knows a lot about the subject. Um, is there a real argument against having a wall that you're aware of? No, I don't. And if you look at the experts, you know, the other day, so both the, the president of the Border Patrol Council, Brandon Judd, as well as the president, they were actually, um, I was removed as the chief. And I'm here today to tell you. You were removed as the chief by whom? By, by the, the current administration. So, okay. so you were taken out of your job by Donald Trump, but correct. you're here to tell us that a wall makes sense anyway. Correct. Okay, just to be clear. That's right. The president is right. The, the president of Border Patrol Council is right. The other day when they had the national press conference and, and they got up and they said the wall works, they're right. And it's not based on a personal you know, political ideology. That's based on historical data and facts that can be proven. Huh. So why do you think people oppose it? You know, that, 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 that I think is a political point that they're trying to make. I personally, in my experience, and I was also, you know, the FBI for 20 years, I was specially in charge of the El Paso division right on the border. Yes. Tucker, I cannot think of a legitimate argument why anyone would not support the wall as part of a multi-layered border security issue. Right. So 
Is it frustrating to you as someone who's actually done this for a living and as far as I can tell is not political and obviously has no partisan reason for doing this, is it frustrating how little time we spent actually debating the question of a wall and instead we're debating Trump this, Trump that, but where's the conversation about the actual border and it, for ways to protect it. Uh, Tucker, again, I think you're right on. We, we're too wrapped up in the, the style, the approach, the fact that it's coming from the current president rather than his substantive issues. If you look at the substantive issues, the strategy has never changed. From, from the gatekeeper strategy from years ago, it's about infrastructure, technology, and personnel. That strategy worked then and it works now. It was approved with the Secure Fence Act in 2006 and 12 and it works now. I don't understand what's changed. What do you make of the argument that anyone who thinks the border needs to be secured and there's a crisis, CNN literally put scare quotes around the word crisis today in a Chiron, is a bigot? What do you think of that? Well, then you can call me that because I believe in what the president is doing. When he says that this is a national security problem, he's absolutely correct. And that just doesn't come just from me. That comes from the professionals that have been doing this their entire adult lives serving the country on the border protecting the citizens. They're saying it works. Why aren't we listening to the experts and the people who do it every day? I don't understand that, Tucker. I don't know why we haven't had you on earlier. I, that's the most compelling case I've seen uh, for this wall. Mr. Morgan, thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to see you. Thank you. Well, we just alluded to it a minute ago, and you've heard it a thousand times. So many, it's like background noise now. Walls are racist. They say it constantly. We could give you a thousand examples. We'll just give you one. This is from MSNBC just over this past weekend. This wall that the president wants is a monument to white nationalism. Anybody who agrees to give any money to this wall is foolish. Well, that was editor of the Root.com, the political editor, Jason Johnson. But hundreds of different people could have said exactly the same thing and have almost word for word. For the media, questioning the racism of Donald Trump's border wall is like questioning gravity. You'd have to be an idiot. It's an it's a open and closed case. If you want a wall or any kind of secure border, you're some kind of white supremacist. What's interesting about this argument, and again, you hear it everywhere, is how Orwellian it is. It's the opposite of the truth. Ask yourself, who exactly supports unrestricted low-wage immigration? Who benefits most? If you made a chart, let's be honest here, you'd have to put rich white people at the very top of the list of supporters. Our endless supply of new immigrants gives them, people in my neighborhood, access to much cheaper household help. Nannies, housekeepers, gardeners, whatever. And it makes the products they buy cheaper. Most of all, it makes them feel virtuous, like they're helping the employees who work for them achieve the American dream. If there's any group in America that supports having more than 20 million people here illegally, it's not our poor, it's people in our richest neighborhoods. Nobody else even comes close. So what's the flip side? Who gets hurt most by our new borderless country? Well, again, not a close call, it's African Americans. Here's Cornell economics professor Vernon Briggs, quote, because most illegal immigrants overwhelmingly seek work in the low-skilled labor market, and because the black American labor force is so disproportionately concentrated in the same low-wage sector, there's little doubt that there is significant overlap and competition for jobs in this sector of the labor, labor market. Given the inordinately high unemployment rates for low-skilled black workers, it is obvious that the major loser in this competition are low-skilled black workers." End quote. In other words, and you already knew this, anyone who thought about it for a second does, low-wage immigration is costing African Americans jobs and money. Other studies have reached the same conclusion. Again, it's obviously true. And because it's obviously true, that's exactly why the people benefiting from the current status quo don't want to have this conversation. It's why they scream bigotry until you shut up. But we won't shut up, and instead we're going to talk to Peter Kirst now. He's a lawyer and a U.S. Civil Rights Commissioner, and he joins us tonight. Mr. Kirst, now thank you very much for coming on, as always. So it just seems to me that this line, border walls are racist, secure borders are racist, you don't like people who look differently from you if you're for it, you're white supremacist. I mean, this is the definition of propaganda given who is hurt by these policies. Right. It may be an uh, aspect of projection uh, if you're going to give them the best opportunity to describe themselves and, and not ascribe yeah. to them racism or immorality, which they describe to anybody who wants to secure a wall. Right. And you're exactly right. Professor Briggs testified before the Civil Rights Commission. We had a whole host of people testifying before the Civil Rights Commission. The one cohort, the one demographic in the United States of America most harmed, most palpably harmed by illegal immigration are black Americans and 
Politicians, open borders politicians know this. They know this because there have been numerous hearings before Congress on this. I've testified in a number of these hearings. George Borjas has testified in a number of these hearings. Uh, Stephen Camerata has testified, and we've presented all of this evidence, all of this data, that the pernicious effect of illegal immigration of open borders has had on black Americans in terms of uh, employment. Nearly one million fewer blacks work today because of the competition from illegal immigration than otherwise would be the case if we had a secure border. And it also depresses wage rates by a tune of $1,800 a year. George Borjas estimates that the depressive effects of illegal immigration on wages is anywhere from $99 billion to $118 billion annually, cumulatively, but it has the most significant effect on the black community. And then you have the downstream effects from this economic effect, and that is you have higher crime rates and incarceration rates, lower marriageability rates because no exactly. one gets married when they're poor, and that has the worst effect on the black community where you've got a 72% out of wedlock birth rate in the black community. But it goes even beyond that. If you take a look at crime rates in the black community, we know that in a number of places, and in fact it's the Obama administration's Justice Department that brought indictments and convictions on the basis of illegal immigrant crime gangs that specifically targeted black communities. These were prosecutions by the Obama Justice Department based on racial targeting. Compton used to be 90% black, it's now 30% black, and a large part of that is because of this targeting. Other communities have suffered the same thing. So if you ask yourself what's racist, I would like to ask members of the Congressional Black Caucus, it's their moniker. They purportedly have assigned this designation to themselves because they have a peculiar interest with respect to issues pertaining to the black community. Ask them about this. Instead, they've capitulated to the open borders crowd for political reasons because an influx of immigration or illegal immigrants, they believe, secures them an electoral advantage and they've thrown blacks under the bus in the process. Why does, you mentioned what has happened to Compton, California. That's at very least an interesting story. I don't think I've ever read that in the Washington Post or the New York Times. Why? Because it's contrary to the overriding political narrative. You know, the narrative that says the biggest malady afflicting America today in the era of Trump is white supremacy. Unfortunately, this has saliency only in elevated academic circles. In the real world, that is not true. What you're seeing on the ground is, is economic competition, you're seeing yes. crime rates, you're seeing a whole host of things that happen to poor black folks and other Americans and the elites apparently are, are either consciously oblivious to it or unconsciously oblivious right. to it, but a lot of politicians know precisely what's going on, yet they do nothing about it. And I know they know precisely what's going on because of the testimonies we've given, because of the data we've submitted, and they simply ignore it. And if you talk about it, they call you names. Unbelievable. Peter Kirsten, now it's always great to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tucker.